Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Let's dive into today's conversation regarding life's myriad transitions and how we refine our responses in our relationships, our wellness, our households, our work, and in our practices. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me a dear longtime friend who is very special to me. The last time I saw her was probably just prior to the pandemic. We sat for tea. She's one of the If I can say this and be so shallow, she's one of the most beautiful friends I have. Her name is Mia Maestro. She practices the way of tea. She's a student of the leaf. She's passionate about meditation, yoga, prison reform, and our planet's last wild places. And she weaves these different worlds through her acting and producing. Today, we're going to touch on tea as a practice, which is something that I have finally recently gotten around to learning deeply, and I'm so excited to discuss. Um, We'll talk about finding the integrity and staying in your heart when you're doing acting work and performing work and producing work even, and we'll also get into a little bit about what's lighting Mia up these days. So Mia, thank you so much for being here. Mm, Thank you for having me, Elena. It's so Mm. beautiful to hear your voice. Same. Same. I finally got a chance to um, take an immersion with Balin, who Mm. hopefully will come on the podcast at some point. And I know that you and she are colleagues, and I would love to know how you got started with tea and what it means to you in these days. Well, um, Balin is one of my dearest sisters, and I actually started studying tea through Balin. Um, I sat with her back when we were both living in Venice, California. We were neighbors and we had been friends for quite a long time. Not close friends, but we had such a beautiful community in common. And then she invited me over. And I've always been a lover of tea since I was uh, very young. It was the most important meal in my family, something that I shared with my beloved grandmother. And I sat with Balin and I felt I was having for the first time tea in my life. And immediately I just wanted to learn and start my own practice. And then I got to meet Balin's teacher, Buddha, uh, who's funded uh, Global Tea Hut and is a wonderful writer and teacher. And I started studying with him. So I'd say Balin and I are tea sisters, dear, dear friends, and old students of Buddha. Yeah. Mm. So much about tea is just about presence. I found, and it's something that you have in enormous quantities and qualities, and I thought it might be nice to discuss somewhere in your childhood, somebody taught you about presence, Mia. And I would love to know who that is or was. I don't know about that. My mother has a lot of presence, but I think that's something I've cultivated. And it's something that I've cultivated first through acting and performing and um, theater mainly. That's how I started performing back in Argentina, where I'm from, in Buenos Aires, my hometown. Yeah, is that relationship to space and the mindful way of navigating that space you learn that very quickly when you're on stage and also I believe the reverence of being on stage and being able to tell a story through your voice and body and also work in harmony with your fellow actors on the same you know quadrant it's normally a square or sometimes it's a beautiful round amphitheater but um whatever the shape you have to you know dance within So I think that was my first kind of like sacred meeting with presence, if I'm going to call it that way. And then through tea, I think I really, I did a deep dive with what actually presence means and mindfulness. 
you know, present with your guests, whoever you're serving tea to, in presence with, um, first of all, the tea, the medicine that you're serving, the leaves, you know, in presence with your teaware, the way you store it, in presence with your tea table, the way you set it up before a tea sit. And it's something that uh, I've also cultivated through yoga, I think, like in presence with your breathing, with your body. As you know, the more we do a practice, it kind of like by osmosis, it permeates our whole lives. You know, after many years of uh, doing, you know, acting as my job, which is very beloved to me, my tea practice, which is I think almost like 15 years that I've been practicing tea, I feel like all these worlds start merging and then it's just, you know, you realize that it's the same presence in all of them. Right. So beautifully said. Um, for our listener who might not know what we're talking about when we talk about tea and the medicine of tea, the plant is known as Camellia sinensis. Yes, yeah, sinensis. Discovered sinensis. Thank you. It was discovered millennia ago around the time of the Shang dynasty along the Yellow River in China. And according to legend, it was discovered by the Chinese emperor and herbalist Shenong around 3000 BCE. So we're going back, you know, 5,000 and some years. He went on a journey to explore distant regions, and he paused to rest. And one of the assistants offered to boil some water for him. He was sitting against a tree, meditating with his bowl of boiled water. When leaves from the tree fell into his bowl, which happened to be a wild camellia sinensis tree, he was touched by the infusion of the leaves in the water and felt compelled to explore the plant which gave birth to tea. When you talked about that presence with which you touch your teaware and you set your tea table and you tend to your guests who have arrived to share the tea with you, it puts me in such a certain place in my nervous system and in my body, sitting with Balin, who is so dear to me. She has a poem in my upcoming book called Softening Time. The poem's called Elder Sister, even though she's much younger than I am. And I feel instantly transported to a place of so much reverence and presence and care. And I just wanted to relay that to our listener because this is a part of my life that has also become very important to me for the last 12 years since meeting Balin for the first time. And it may be something that you want to explore. That's all. Mia, when you take guests for tea does that still happen first of all yes yes mm. i uh, you know I, I serve tea to dear friends at home right. it's one of my favorite ways of just connecting with people in silence and at a frequency level and over the past years with a little bit of a pause during covid times I've been serving tea in prisons and juvenile halls. So I have a lot of guests. You know, I go to them because they don't have the capability of coming out of the facilities. So I've been serving a lot of tea and it's been quite life changing just to be able to bring my practice to prisoners and people that don't have the possibility to just have these practices because they're um, incarcerated. Mm. You know, it's really strange. I've just begun teaching yoga in the prisons here to the men who are incarcerated here in New Mexico. And I wonder if you could share a little bit. I also run a group, um, I'm part of a group, excuse me, called On the Inside, where we go into women's prisons all over the country and teach art, expression, acting, music, to the women, it has been completely transformative for the incarcerated women. We don't realize how devastating our system is for people who have made grievous mistakes in their lives. They just get locked up. It's very, very rare that they get the chance to actually really and truly be rehabilitated and reintroduced in a constructive way back into society. So I really feel this. And also being part of a cycle of healing, right? I feel like our system, especially in the United States, they just perpetrate the hurt and the blame and the guilt. And um, as you know, because I'm sure you've experienced it, when you bring an offering to those contexts, 
it just people really soak it up and they're extremely grateful. And it just becomes a really transformational exchange where I am the most transformed when I get to share my practice with people that have been incarcerated. I've done tea in um through a wonderful nonprofit called Healing Dialogue in Action. I met uh, Javier Staurig through uh, Scott Budnick, who's been such a huge energetic thunder that has propelled so much change in the prison reform system in California. And Scott introduced me to Javier Staurig, who runs Healing Dialogue in Action. Um, Javier is Scott's mentor. That's how Scott describes him. And he just invited me to come. And it's been really just beautiful first in level four prisons with people that have life sentences to be able to find a space of mindfulness and also silence and community within the groups that I've been serving. I've done sits with women in level four prisons with men, but recently I've started serving in juvenile halls and that's been just extremely hopeful because um Thanks to Scott and, and many of the reforms in the California law, those kids now have a way out of the system. So we've been diving in really deeply, so deeply, and so moving to see, to sitting and having bowls of tea in silence. But then these kids have been so interested in meditation. So I've been teaching them in a very simple way, just going through Anapana with them and just my finals meditation. And it's amazing, you know, how quickly everyone's just just meditating every morning in their cells wow. and serving each other tea. Yeah. I can't get over this, actually. I just want our listener to know that this is a very seriously close matter to me as I enter into Buddhist chaplaincy training next year. And I didn't realize that this was going to be a part of our conversation. I didn't know that you actually did this. And I'm like bursting inside of my heart to find out how to connect this to the system here in New Mexico in some way, particularly with the juvenile centers. So I'm really excited to learn about this. Thank you. Yeah, we can find a way. I mean, there's so many wonderful bailing and so many people from our tea community have moved or are based mm -hmm. in New Mexico that I think there's ways we can expand it. I've been dreaming of the idea of creating a juvenile hall program called like Juvenile Zen, where a lot of Zen practices can come into place that we can bring, you know, meditation and tea and calligraphy and, you know, walking meditation, sitting meditation, Chabana, Ikebana. I mean, there's so many... Zen has so many paths to development and enlightenment. So there's just so many, um, a gift for everyone. You know, what are you drawn to? So it's just such an open space for expression and study. So yeah, so maybe you can help me develop it or brainstorm on it. I'm with you. 100% we're doing this. The Four Virtues of Tea, as Balin teaches it. Balin is Wudeh's student. Wudeh is spelled W-U-D-E. I'll include all of these in the show notes. His work is through globalteahut.com. Really beautiful, comprehensive coursework, classes, products. I own so many of the teas as well. The Four Virtues of Tea. Purity, reverence, harmony, fourth virtue. It's hard to put a name to it when nothing is amiss. Just pure presence. We're stepping into full presence. There's no other place that I would rather be. And this fourth virtue kind of arises naturally. I thought that would be nice to just mention, like, this is a whole world, our listener, mm -hmm. of learning and um, deep wells of contentment and calming, grounding. Yeah, it's. Um, oh, I love that fourth virtue because it just involves and emanates mystery. And as we know, in Zen, there's always a space for mystery, you know, where you just have to rely on it. Yep. And uh, there's so much discipline and so many things to do. And T has that. It's, you know, you learn the form and you repeat the form. Mm. And advanced forms are just simple forms repeated many times. Right. Uh, but then you always leave that space for the void for the mystery where you're even surprised that whatever arises 
and you always leave the space or you create the space for it. And that's what tea is. And also that's what, you know, acting when the pathos comes through you, that's what acting is. You prepare, you learn your lines, you prepare your stage, you have your props, you have your costumes, but then you always just breathe deeply and you just let the spirit come, you know, and just take over the stage. And the stage, as we talked before, could be your yoga mat or your tea table or, you know, your circle. If you're doing a ritual, if you're doing a vision quest, you just sit and just wait for the elements to or the spirits to show. That's something that I always keep in mind, you know, just like leave that space, very tended space, but just leave it open. When she was teaching this fourth virtue, Balin, she said, you know, it's so painful trying to control everything. It's a tragedy, she said. She went on to say you're either fault-finding or plotting and scheming. And this time, this place, this state, this fourth virtue is much more likely to arise if we are practicing a lot, you know, rather than like studying, reading, you know. It requires hands and presence and doing, which not really doing, but just being in the space and setting the space to be in the space, like you said, to allow for something that is unexpected to arise. Yeah. And, you know, I'm quite intellectual. So I love the reading and the studying because that gives me like so much inspiration. And I also am a doer and I have a lot of discipline. I've done so many films since I was quite young. And Mm -hmm. so even just the structure of a film set just gives you so much discipline. We work, you know, a normal day for an actor is 12, 14 hours. That's a usual day. It could go to 18, 19 if you have extra hours. But I feel that all those years of discipline, but also it's just having the patience and the endurance of knowing that sometimes the magic or the mystery is elusive. And sometimes, as we all know, that first moment of romance with the practice where like, oh, like I feel this is for me and I could actually be a devotee of this practice my whole life. And then sometimes practices are long marriages too. And you go through really hard times where the magic and the mystery disappears. But it's that endurance and that discipline that just makes you keep on going. And that's when the mystery really unravels, you know, for me, after dedicating a life and your energy for over a decade to a practice. And then the, all the practices that you may have in your life just coming together, like there's this beautiful image by Rumi that is like you can drop of oil and then another drop of oil, another one, another one. And then one day, all those drops, they would just become one. So it's really lovely to come a little bit older and just start realizing that that's started happening for me. It's just, it's actually a quite peaceful and kind of like a no mind going back to what Bailing was saying in her teachings and you quoted just going to that no mind space of just letting it be. Just follow the tea. (laughs) Stay with the tea. (laughs) Always stay with the tea. Stay with the tea. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Don't lose track of the tea. Oh gosh, it's so lovely to talk to you. I would love to give our listener a little taste if you're listening to us right now and you'd like to take a look at what Mia has in the world. Her website is Mia, M-I-A, Maestro, M-A-E-S-T-R-O, M-I-A, M-A-E-S-T-R-O.com, Mia Maestro. And you can find on her website, you know, film. She makes some incredible music. One of the music videos I know our friend Michael made, there's a whole section for the way of tea, but I would love to hear Sister to sister, what moves you right now in your world of performing and producing? What moves you to talk about it and give it voice right now? Oh, I'm actually in the midst of pre-production on the adaptation of this beautiful book called The Immortality Key by Brian Wurrescu. And it's gorgeous text and it's based and talks about ancient psychedelics in the Roman Empire and in ancient Greece. And I'm just really excited about this project. We're producing it with my friend Christiana Mask and Genevieve and Steve Juvertson and Lydia Keeves and 
the XTR studio. And yeah, just wonderful putting this story together and our team together, finding the right director for the story. And yeah, I just have a lot of love for Brian's work and you know what this book is about. So it's been really nice for me to be just behind the camera. You know, it's my second time producing. I, I co-produced a documentary with Na uh, National Geographic Society called Into the Okavango about the Okavango Delta in Botswana. Uh, but this is my first time really helming a producing project. So yeah, that's been really exciting. And Wonderful. Yeah. Christiana's and, a nice lady. I met her once. Uh, yeah. Christiana's dear, dear, dear sister. Yeah, she's very sharp, very kind. I'm happy you're working together. That makes me feel very good. Um, yeah, it's beautiful when you get to work with friends, you know, because you have so many things are already aligned, your values and that's right. what you want for this world. And Christiana is one of those people that I really look up to. We've been dear friends for a long time. So it's just been exciting working together. Yeah. Yeah. And of the films that you've done previously which of those do you feel is your sort of I don't know proudest I don't know I don't even know what the word is like what's one that you would say oh our listener you know this one is reflective of my capacities mm. I've done so many <laughs> it's a long career I'm so grateful mm. for it but mm. um there's one that is actually coming out in the state in May, and it's called The Cow Who Sang a Song About the Future by Francisca Alegria, wow. um, a wonderful Chilean filmmaker. Yes. And it came out at Sundance last year, and it's a really beautiful independent film and a film that talks about a family very much in need of healing. And the healing of the family also prompts the healing of, you know, the environment and the nature around them. So it's this two ecosystems, the family and nature just healing together in parallel. So yeah, it's a very special film. And as we all know, indie films, this day and age, they need a lot of love and energy. So I would love for whoever's listening to have a peek and take a look at it. And um, there's many And that's projects. the cow who sang a song to save the Into world? Yeah, the cow who sang a song into the future. The um, cow who mm -hmm. sang a song into the future. I'm saying it again so that we can really hear it. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. And then there's other many projects, you know, that I'm really proud of. But I think that one has a special place in my heart. And then there's, you know, new movies that are coming. And there's been some wonderful stories that have, you know, landed in my hands. One that I'm doing in New Jersey this summer they were filming and it has to do with prison reform. So I'm just really, really excited wow. about filming this and acting in it. And another beautiful film that I'm shooting with my friend Lucio Castro, who's a wonderful Argentine director who lives in New York. So yeah, there's so many exciting projects and um, amazingly, there's just time for everything. You know, I think I, Oh, that to meditation. I feel like the more I meditate, <laughs> the more time I actually sit, there's more time within my day and year, which is, you know, it's hard to explain that to folks that don't have a daily meditation practice. But I think you know what I'm talking about. You know, sometimes you feel like time expands the more you sit <laughs> in mindfulness. Just this is exactly my experience. People ask me all the time, how do you have time? You're, you're doing so many different things. It's like, I don't know. I sit for meditation in the morning, at least 30 minutes, sometimes an hour. I have no issue getting all the things that I want to attend to, attended to. <laughs> yeah, so I've been finding myself that if I need more time in my day, I just sit a little bit longer. <laughs> That's right. It's so strange. It has a way of expanding time. It's like sitting for tea, though, also. I now serve myself about three to four mornings a week, the tea. Do the whole setup as though somebody else were coming over. And then I just serve myself. And those mornings, they go on forever. Yes. And also you access such a deep state of meditation. You know, yes. tea has been a tool for that for 
hundreds, if not thousands of years, it's been used by monks all over the world just to achieve those really enlightened and subtle sensation, you know, meditations. And it just gives you the energy as well because it's really clean caffeine and it gives you the focus and also it gives you the energetic awareness of the body. I wanted to ask you if you can share with us, I'm always interested in what kind of meditation you've been doing lately. What's been your go-to? Well, since 2020, I've been studying with Roshi Joan Halifax at the Upaya Zen Center here in Santa Fe, mostly online until this year. This year in January, I did the winter practice period in person. So that means I was there for one month and I was meditating between five and seven hours a day. And Zen, Soto Zen in particular, the tradition of Soto Zen, which came from China as Chan meditation, which came from, of course, India. Soto Zen is a tradition that really centers around just sitting. In Japanese, it's called Shikan Taza, and it really is just silent illumination. There's nothing to do. There's no mantra, no mudra, no practice other than bowing, and now I've taken the precepts, so I have my rock su that I sewed over the whole year, and I put that on my head. I say the verse of the robe to myself three times, and then I place it around my neck, and I sit. It's so fascinating, Mia, how, I mean, I've known you a long time. I met Balin so many, so many years ago. I was never connected to Zen except for some thread energetically knowing that someday I would be old enough to understand it. And what I realize is that the older I get, the only reason why I understand whatever shred I understand is because I'm just getting older and quieter and stopping needing to know. Mm. I can just sit still. And I do think age helps And I do think the sooner we introduce this concept to the children, which is why I'm obsessed with the possibility of serving to children, the sooner we do that with children, the sooner they have a taste of this state. So that's what I practice twice a day, sitting. I have a little corner. I face the wall in my bedroom. I have a small altar, but I don't face the altar. I face the wall. And um, I can't tell you how much it's helped me. There aren't words, really. It's a really unique feeling. I practice Zen as well. And just to find that space and that focus just by body posture only. Again, it just involves that mystery that we were talking about, where you just like make the space with your body and your limbs and, you know, your hand position and you just maintain it. And I also find quite interesting to practice with you know like a semi-gaze or like eyes half open yeah just that's how it's done here yeah a, yeah it just gives you such a different clarity and understanding of the posture and the meditation but also an understanding of the space around you yes but in other forms of meditation just gets canceled so there's a transformation within you within the space mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. um it's hard to put it into words but Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you're talking about. And I do agree completely. The sooner it is introduced in schools and the younger generations, it's, you know, because it's a long practice that it requires sometimes years to understand. So the younger people are introduced to it, I think, has the possibility of changing and reverting a lot of things that should be reverted in this planet. Yeah, we don't in the society anyway. we, We aren't taught to be present for reality as it is. We're literally fed every image of what we need to be that we're not. Mm. And this wholesale acceptance of things as they are, like full willingness to allow things to be as they are without trying to change them, is like a level of stability that I've never known before. Mm. Never. And I'm still like figuring it out, you know. But I do know what you said to your point. Keeping my eyes closed in meditation... I am so fast in some dreamland, making things up, you know, finding my way into some trouble. Whereas if I keep my eyes partially softly open, spine tall, head gently bowed, hands in cosmic mudra, I can very, very easily 
just be present for reality as it is, of course, until a thought comes, and then I have to go back to the breathing and start over. But still, that whole process is like training us to live with the pain of loss. It's training us to live with grief. It's training us to live with aging. It's training us to die. You know, I've never felt this way about any practice before, like so committed, so fully committed that I'm magnetized to my seat now, where it used to be like such a task. Oh, check it off, you know? Mm. So different. Yeah. And also the training to non-reactivity, you know? And also what I love about that practice is the understanding to the importance of really divest from outcome. And I Mm. think a lot of meditation techniques that you know you hear about they're still like set up in this kind of like capitalistic paradigm where like if I meditate I'm more productive if I meditate I'm calmer and of course there's so many blessings from a meditation practice that one gets to have and of course one sees a different understanding of the world through meditation and your life and your body but truly To sit in meditation with no interest whatsoever, you know, with no outcome, with no positive or negative solution that may come after that time that one is meditating. Same thing with tea. It's a really beautiful place to arrive to. And I've been... Yeah. As we get older, yeah. Yeah. And I've been also kind of toying with the idea and practicing also that with acting. Whereas, like, how could you actually act with just for the full expression the full expression of the word or the body movement and actually divest from the outcome you know which is sometimes hard in my industry because of course everything's about outcome and how the film does or doesn't do Mm. or what about you just act for that story that was just landed on your lap like that story just wanted to be told and it's just a ceremony or it's just a vowing to that story And that's Mm. it. So it's just been interesting for me to change my thought orientation on my job, you know? Totally. The um, music that's coming out of your body right now, the latest uh, sort of venture is called Si Agua. Mm. By the way, I've been learning Spanish. I'm on day 187 on Duolingo, and I can totally understand now. It's unbelievable. (laughs) I have to say, it's not the latest venture. It's the only album I have out, and it's been out for a while. Okay, got it. it. (laughs) But I am due new songs, and uh, I've been singing quite a lot. But a new album or a new offering to the world hasn't been, you know, formed yet. But I have been singing actually quite a lot. But it's been kind of like a private activity for me in the past years, yeah. It's funny, I find myself singing in the morning most days when there's nobody around. It's better than smoking pot. I'm sure. Oh my God, so much (laughs) better. I don't smoke pot. Not (laughs) my medicine, but but, but I'm sure it is. (laughs) It it was a part of my life for a long time. Um, This musical collaboration of yours that was recorded in Iceland, one last question on it. I just realized that you've collaborated with Damien. Yeah. Rice. I love that. I think we discovered this some time ago that we share him as a mutual friend. He's such a good person, such a good egg. Oh, yeah. Damien, what an incredible and special human in this world. Yeah. Yes. God. Such a bright light and powerful voice, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So last question, I know that you're in Los Angeles. I know that you're going to be in the summer in New Jersey filming this film on prison reform. Can you talk a little bit about that particular project so that we can get some context? It's called Beneath the Grass. And it's the story about a mother of a seven-year-old beautiful son who is a trimmer. So she is a pot dealer, but not nowadays, but back when Obama was being elected. Mm -hmm. So as we know, the laws back then were quite different. So she has to deal with the possibility of being caught and going to prison in that context. So it's a beautiful, beautiful and sweet story. And I'm excited just to give my all to this character and and this beautiful script. Mm. 
I cannot wait to see it. And um, for our listener, this is just kind of for fun and silly, but anyway, among the many, many films that Mia has done, she was also in Motorcycle Diaries, which Mm -hmm. is one of my favorites. And if you haven't seen it, it's really worth your time. It's an important film, and it tells a story that not many people really know. And I feel very happy that I got to see it laying in bed with Lisa Cooper in the south of Spain in Andalusia while I was teaching a retreat. And that was our evening activity one night. And it was like one of the best films I've ever seen by far. So thank you for that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a dear film in my heart. I bet. I feel so full from talking to you. I feel reconnected to my practice. I'm going to go sit right now and serve myself some tea in the middle of the day, which I don't usually do. I really love you. I respect the level of care and precision and attention that you bring to your work and to the things that you care about. I can't tell you how much I really admire the work that you're doing with the incarcerated people uh, for whom I have a great big space in my heart and more time in my life than ever before. And I want to thank you for being here today. Really a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's mm-hmm. really beautiful to to chat with you and be connected. Yes. And when I come to LA, whenever that happens, you are on my list to call and to spend some time in silence together. Always. Yeah. Thank you for your friendship, Mia. Mm, thank you, Elena. See you soon.